concept that a lot of modern people find very hard to accept is that their minds have defilements. They think that their minds are perfectly fine. There's nothing dirty or defiling about anything in their minds. In particular because a lot of people come to Buddhism to get away from the idea, say, of original sin, thought that they're somehow inherently bad. And they've heard that Buddhism teaches that we're inherently good, that we all have Buddha nature. Well, one, there are types of Buddhism that teach that, but the Buddha himself never taught that. In fact, he never talked about the nature of the mind at all. And two, the fact that the mind has defilements doesn't mean that we're necessarily good or bad or anything. It's just recognize it that there are states of mind that obscure the mind. They obscure clarity, they obscure the brightness that can be found in the mind. And the problem is that we tend to identify with a lot of them. We identify ourselves with our greed, with our aversion, with our delusions. But we don't like to recognize them as such. We speak of them in other ways. This is my identity. This is my background. This is the way I've been brought up. This is how I've learned how to function in the world. This, these are the attitudes people have. There's a passage in one of the John Mahabhu's Dhamma talks. Always mentioning to the monks, suppose the Buddha were able to see your defilements, don't you think he'd be disgusted? I've heard people react to that, saying, the Buddha wouldn't be disgusted with us, and the Buddha would love us. He would be compassionate toward us. I mean, that's really defining yourself very intensely with your defilements. Our attitude is, love me, love my defilements. But it's because the Buddha has compassion for us is that he points out that the mind has defilements and they can be removed. That's the important point is that the fact that there's a defilement there doesn't mean there's a permanent stain on the mind. It's not like grape juice or something you can't wash out. But it is important to recognize that these things do cause suffering and they certainly obscure the mind. We have to let them go. It's good to see these things not as things in the mind, but as actions, as habits. Greed is an habitual action. So is anger. So is delusion. These are the ways we deal with the world, react to the world, shape the world. And we've gotten some results through them, which is why we tend to hold on to them. These are part of our repertory of tools. But they're pretty shoddy tools, and they do a very crude and clumsy job. When you look at human history, and you read in each generation that there's so many good things that could have been done that weren't done because of people's greed, anger, and delusion. And it's amazing that the human race has gotten as far as it has. Some people think it's because of their greed that we have progress. But you see what happens when greed gets unbridled. The economy turns into a huge casino. And the things that could be done with the wealth of the country just get fritted away. The same with anger. You think of all the money that's spent for armies, munitions, all the mines that are used in order to create all kinds of weapons, and all that intelligence that could be used to solve so many real problems in life. Again, it's amazing that the human race has gotten as far as it has. And delusion is even worse. 
prevents us from seeing the harm that's caused by these qualities in the mind. The case in point is when, we're, when we look back at our upbringing, we come to Buddhism from other traditions, Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, and a lot of attitudes get buried deep in the mind from these traditions. Or we may be coming from a modern Western scientific attitude, materialist attitude. And something deep down inside us insists that Buddhism bend itself in order to meet what we think is right or wrong. Or we feel that we're abandoning our identity, we're abandoning our background, our family, if we adopt Buddhist beliefs. Again, that's thinking of our identity as a thing that can't really be changed. And this is precisely where the Buddha says, no. Your identity is made up of clinging aggregates. The clinging itself is an action. The aggregates are actions. Each of the aggregates is defined by an activity. Form deforms. In other words, it keeps changing. Feelings feel, perceptions perceive, fabrications fabricate the other aggregates into actual aggregates, and consciousness cognizes. These things are defined by their activity, and those are the raw materials from which we create our sense of self. And in our delusion, we tend to think of self as a thing that we are stuck with either for metaphysical reasons or for social reasons. Or but it's not the case. Selfing is something that we do. We can pick up things from our environment. We pick up ideas from our environment. Largely in the course of our quest for happiness, our quest for pleasure. We find that certain things are under our control, and there are certain things that we want. And we define ourselves around the, the we that controls and the we that wants or wants to experience certain things. Self as producer, self as consumer. And each of us, even though we may have been brought up in the same environment as our siblings, we find that we have very different senses of who we are and who they are. So it's not the case that we are irrevocably formed by our environment. It's through our interaction with our environment that we create our sense of what's possible, what we can do, what we want, what's worth wanting. Some of that's picked up from outside, but some of it's exactly that. We do the picking up. If you've ever been a parent, you realize there's only so much you can force on your child. And yet when we look at ourselves, we feel that our parents had this huge influence this way or that, but we were the ones doing a lot of the choosing. And so the question is, did we make good choices? And if we didn't, we can always change them. When you see the act of identification simply as that, as an act. And your many different identities are different patterns of actions, different strategies. Then you can begin to ask yourself, well, which of these strategies provide good results and which ones muddy things up? Which of the motivations behind these strategies are clear and clean? In other words, they harm nobody. They don't harm you. They don't harm anybody else. And what kind of pleasures are clear and clean in the sense they don't get you intoxicated and blinded? Those questions often go together. If you have a pleasure that you really enjoy and yet it causes harm to other people, you tend to deny the fact that it causes harm to them. And so you blind yourself.
So this is why it's important to adopt the Buddhist point of view of looking at the mind as a bundle of actions. It's not a thing. It's just lots of different actions in here, lots of different strategies. And some of them keep the mind obscured, dark, darkened from what it could be. And when the Buddha points this out to us, it's not because he wants to criticize us in the sense of the Buddha being disgusted at our defilements, is because he learned how to be disgusted with his own. Having a very strong sense of, strength of how long he'd been under their power and given in to them, identified himself with them, and then realizing all the damage that was done. So he'd had enough. You know, that word nibida, which we translate as disenchantment, can also mean disgust. You've been feeding on these things for who knows how long, and you've realized it's been just causing a lot of damage. You thought you were getting good nourishment, but that was not the case. And so in his compassion, he sees other people suffering from the same misunderstandings. And so when he points it out to us that these are defilements, these do obscure what we could actually see in the mind, if we want to let ourselves let go of them, create better strategies, better habits in the mind. So we don't have to defend, depend on the old clumsy ones. We can establish better tools so we can throw away the old shoddy tools. This is an important step in the practice and an important understanding. And it really does help to see our defilements as defilements. They really do defile the mind. And as I said, though, it's not like they put a permanent stain on the mind. The Buddha's images of clouds in front of the sun. They darken it. But the clouds don't have to be there. And when they do leave, they don't leave a stain on the sun. And so it's because the Buddha wanted us to see the brightness that is possible when the mind is cleaned of these defilements, cleansed of these defilements. That was his compassion. So learn how to see these things in this way. Look at aspects of what you may think of as yourself, your identity, the beliefs, and the things you picked up from your environment. And you may have an attachment to them or a sentimental attachment, nostalgia. But you have to realize that it's, they do do a lot of harm in the mind. And it's only when you recognize that fact that you can be free from them, free from that harm. And the fact that some of the defilements are ones that you identify with more than others, that you really hold on tight, that doesn't mean that they really are genuinely yours. It's simply that their habits are more deeply entrenched. They're going to take a longer time to dig up. But the first step is learning how to see them as a problem. That you really would be better off without them.